the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of scaring loss, the Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know it is finished i will not boast of anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. Is anybody, anybody singing for us today? I could have the chimes come back up and do it again, couldn't I? Miss April, Miss April's dad's in the hospital this morning, I believe. Is he at Beckley? Yeah. They need to, they need, they need to find why he's, he's losing a lot of blood, and they need to find out why. So all the work she's been doing for us this weekend and past week and stuff like that, I know that kind of weighs on her a little bit there too. I think Miss Becky's got one or Jess and Miss Hope, did you get a copy of Wilds? We need to take a look at this and I was given Sunday school. We need to check on Sam Neal, Lexi Neal, Wyatt Dunn, Troy Warfield, um, Ben and Elijah thing, we need to check on them. That's the names already given me. I'm going to check on Sir Shea there and Sam and Tanner and see if there's still, if you guys want to have one last hurrah here at camp or something like that. But we got our camp registrations and we want to make sure we got everybody's name that's pops going to go. Miss Nancy, I see your name on this. Well, I'm telling you what, it, it's only going up, folks. It's getting better. Okay. That's, you all want to give her some tips about get, getting her running shoes on and her stair-stepping shoes on. Okay. okay. Anything else? Wilds Camp, June. It'll come faster than we think. Lord willing, June 27th to July 2nd. It's, it's going to be something. And um, Peyton, I want you to still think. If that doesn't collide with a football camp, I want you to think about going to K Partner. All right. Someone's got to go on and keep Abby in line. All right. Oh, that'll work. Uh, Britt, where's old Britt at? Well, Britt, seeing you registered for camp, that makes my day too, buddy. This gonna this gonna be a good one. Ella, where's all your where's all your friends? You're all by yourself. Okay. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 25. I think at least two messages in a row will tie each other together from other messages and last week and Wednesday night. And sometimes I know on Wednesday night, if you're not listening on the streaming like this previous Wednesday night, it's just a handful of folks here. And so some of the things I have to repeat, knowing that not everyone heard the foundation of where we're going and what part we're at now. Yeah, I hope it, the redundancy is not um, 
boring to anybody. Maybe something new will be shared. The message title from last Sunday morning was Somewhere Out There. And I'm going to continue on with Wednesday night and last Sunday and continue on with Also Out There. Also Out There. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let's jump to the ending of this passage, Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, realizing that's the goats, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is one of those messages where I, if I could skip it, I would. There's other messages I enjoy more. I, I stand condemned that John Rice said years ago that no one should speak about hell or eternal damnation without a tear in their eye. And I find that I can't muster that up. Seems like I just speak it as a fact and I, I, can't seem to, I can't seem to just all of a sudden turn on the tears and give some false emotion about, about eternity. I can get more teared up thinking about heaven than I can about hell. So I stand, I stand just acknowledging my fault from the beginning that... I'll probably smile somewhere along the line in this message, and I probably shouldn't. I may say something frivolous along the line in this message, and I know I shouldn't. But I will try and come to the end and give the appropriate ending of a point or two that should be to myself and to everyone also. Somewhere else, somewhere also out there. I know out there is the Father's house. Jesus said, in my Father's house. I used the passage in Hebrews 4, verse 14, where it says, Jesus passing into the heavens. Somewhere in the heavens is the Father's house. God is omniscient, knows everything. God is omnipotent, can do everything. And I know the scriptures teach that God is omniscient. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Whither shall I go, David said, from thy presence or from thy spirit? To the deepest part of the uh, farthest parts of the sea or to the deepest parts of the earth. Behold, thou art there. I know God is omnipresent. And by the spirit of God, he can be everywhere. But the Bible says he has a house. A house is the word translated dwelling place. There is a Central headquarters. There is a throne of God. Let us come boldly into the throne of grace. There is a place of God's throne. And Jesus is passed into that. He said, I go to, to prepare a place for you. Where is that at? In my Father's house. I've heard one or two others try and make that different than what, what it is. I believe some of our Fundamental English, English 101, is make sure you have subject verb agreement in understanding and writing. If you start a letter and you start it in the singular, you need to continue it in the singular and sign it in the singular. If you're talking plural, then you ought to, you know, you ought to use plural, plural pronouns and plural, plural verbs because you want to keep it in agreement. Basic, basic English. The subject verb agreement in John chapter 14. You know, let not your hearts be troubled. If we took chapter 14 out of there, we're realizing he's tying, tying the chap, into chapter 13 in there where Jesus said, I go away. 
and their hearts were sorrowful that, that he was leaving. He will continue in John 14 that while he's gone, I will send another comforter. I'm going to send some, while I am gone, I'm going to send another comforter to be with you while I am gone. I, I go away. Let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. So he's describing where he's going to. I'm going to the Father's house. He's saying what I'm going to do while I'm there. To prepare a place for you. Why? So that where I am. Where is he at? Father's house. There you may be also. Subject verb agreement. I'm comforting you and let you know. I'm going away. While I'm gone, I'll send another comforter. While I'm gone, I'm preparing a place. Where am I preparing it? In the Father's house. And what's the promise? That someday we'll all be together. Same place. I know somewhere out there is the heavens that Jesus passed into and is set down at the right hand of God and ever liveth to make intercession and prepare. I know somewhere out there, John says in Revelation 14, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A magnificently adorned city coming down. Where's it at right now? Somewhere out there. Coming here. I also know out there are the saints of God. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, classic verse, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where's the Lord? In the Father's house. In 2 Corinthians, John, Paul also wrote that one caught up into, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but one caught up into paradise in the presence of the Lord, seeing unspeakable things. Where's that? Where's where the Lord at? When he promises to return, he said, he will bring them with him. And so shall we ever be caught up together with them in the clouds. Somewhere out there, when we walk into the house on a starry night are the saints of God. And when the Lord returns, we read on Wednesday night, and the armies, twice in Revelation, with the army of God, and then the armies of God are coming back with him. And some will say, well, that's going to be his holy angels. And I do believe the angels, as they said on Wednesday night, can fight for the Lord. Could he not call 12 legions of angels to deliver himself from in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, he could. Did, did not Elijah or Elisha pray that the servant's eyes be opened and he saw in the mountains God's army? What a view. And I'm sure God's angelic host can fight for him. But Revelation also says, and they're clothed in clean and white. It's the saints. Amen. It's the saints. He's coming back and riding horses with him. What a magnificent thought. Somewhere out there is the Father's house. Somewhere out there is the holy city. Somewhere out there in the presence of God are our loved ones. But there's something else out there. Matthew chapter, or if I can just requote John 14, who said, I go to prepare a place for you. Did you notice in Matthew 25, Look back again in verse number 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There's a prepared place for the sheep. There's a fold. In the great parable that the Lord said, you get this when you, in the great parable where he talks about how the, the sower sowed and the field grew wheat and then the the wicked one came in and sowed tares and they grew together and they, this angel said, should we separate the tares from wheat? He said, no, let it be till the end. And then the end comes, the end of the world comes. He said, now let's do the separation and the, and the wheat is gathered into the barn. That's the father's house. And there's rejoicing. And the tares, he said, cast into the fire. There is a prepared place for the sheep. Let's go down to verse 41 again. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, 
Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And since the, the devil's an eternal being, and since the demons are eternal beings, there's an eternal place prepared for such creatures. And by the way, you're eternal. And I'm eternal. The question is, is where are we going to spend eternity? Chapter 1 of the book you gave Kirsten to go, if, whether go or not, but I just wanted you to read the first chapter in Bob Jones Sr., the old famous Methodist evangelist. He said he had came, to, he said his first two points in his book, Things I've Learned, is number one is, you know, everyone's going to be, spend somewhere for eternity. And the great dominating truth is that your life sometime must come under the, under the, what should we say, the dominance or should come under the guidance of that great truth. You're eternal. You're going to spend somewhere for eternal, for eternity. You must live now preparing for that place. And when you put your life under the control of that thought, it changes everything. You're eternal. And there's an eternal place prepared for the sheep. You see in this passage, there's an eternal prepared place prepared for the devil and his angels. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Since we had that judgment, he said, he calls all the nations before him. Use a Wednesday night statement again. The world doesn't mind an anemic Jesus. The world doesn't mind the pale Galilean. Oh, if we could just keep Jesus meek and humble and lowly and everyone just come to, 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 the, to the pale Galilean, we'll have no trouble. But what about the one who comes whose name is faithful and true, the word of God, king of kings, lord of lords, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. What about that Jesus that returns? Second Peter 2, that chapter has the deal. On, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm debating about going to this book next after Revelation because it details end times, also like the book of Jude. There shall come false prophets among you, among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. That's verse 1. Now, he's going to make a promise. I'm going to deal with those false teachers. Jude says there's going to be certain men crept in unawares, and they shall teach in the gainsaying of Korah. They shall teach the error or doctrine of Balaam. So there's going to be in the last time great deception. There's going to be false teachers and false prophets. This chapter here is the Lord saying, I'm going to deal with that. Look at verse 3. Through, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. I don't know of a more gullible group and a more, uh, I don't know why. Maybe because covetousness is the root, root of all love of money, covetousness is the root of all evil, that Satan knows it's a weak spot for all humanity to want more. You might have the whole Garden of Eden, but there's one tree. You want more. And I don't know, through covetousness, these false teachers are going to market the church. You want to get us with any kind of sales program uh, and any kind of book, false teaching. They'll make merchandise of you, as I did, it, and market it to the church. Matter of fact, there's a famous little booklet Brother Jimmy Jones gave it to me before he passed away and calls, and this little church went to market. This, this haunts me. It just came to my mind. I'm going to share it with a couple some men here real, real soon, but so much that I put it in front of the Bible. It was written by an Anglican priest, and I don't know when. And I don't know where, his name was Sam Pasco, but he said this. In the first century Palestine, Christianity was a community of believers. Then it moved to Greece and became a philosophy. 
Then it moved to Rome and became an institution, church and state. Then it moved to Europe and became a culture, the Western culture. America, the Western culture. Listen to this last one. Then it moved to America and became a business. Business as usual. Peter says, inspired scriptures, last days, false prophets and teachers are going to make a business of the church. That haunts me that church just becomes business. Just becomes a social club. Just becomes the next thing we do. Anyways, verse 4, but if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Catch us now. He's telling you, God's going to deal with false teachers and their followers. Because if he spared not the angels... Those magnificent created beings, cherubims and seraphims, in all their glory, but since they would turn in deception with Lucifer and think that they could have higher positions, if God could say, you angels are out, and not only cast out of heaven, but thrown into hell, if God can do that with angels, then he goes like this, and the world that then was. What a magnificent world it was. Maybe we can sit back and I'm thinking of that song, I see birds. And we look back and think of this beautiful creation. Can you imagine what it was before the flood? That, this is what God looked at, by the way, and stood back and said, that's very good. But because of sin, God destroyed it. If he can destroy and the angels and put him in hell and he can destroy the whole creation that he made so wonderfully well, he said, you better beware, you false teachers and prophets. Amen. But by the way, he says, and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the world. Here's what God can do. He can judge sin and he can rescue the saint. Because he has a prepared place for sheep, and he has a prepared place for goats. And in hell, probably the most familiar place that we see that used is in Luke 16, where the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom or his presence with the saints. And the rich man, oh, how just simple, plain it says, and he died and in hell. He lift up his eyes, being in torment. I think a lot of things are mysterious to me. I think sleep's mysterious. You know that we just throw our body into a state of semi-unconsciousness for eight hours. Boom. And just like we had to fill up a car with gas and fill up the human body with food to keep going, isn't it amazing that every so often... We just got to throw ourselves down on a couch or on a floor in a car seat, maybe at an office desk, or maybe, hopefully not driving, but hopefully, or just we have these things called bed. We have these rooms called bedrooms, and no matter how, how strong we are, how smart we are, every so many hours of the day, we just got to throw our state in semi-unconsciousness. And there we are. Isn't that kind of funny? Kind of mysterious? And there we lay. And the mind's still going. Sometimes we remember it, sometimes we don't. You know, it's crazy. But on top of all that, I think about it. Mystery, what if you pass away in your sleep? When do you realize this ain't a dream anymore? What would it be like to pass away in your sleep? And I want to go ahead and start singing the song and find yourself breathing new air and finding it celestial. Touching a hand and finding it's God. When do you realize, I'm not sleeping anymore. I'm in heaven. 
Well, how did that happen? <laughs> what a glorious way to go, right? It's like Peter in the prison. <laughs> Maybe he's dozing off. And an angel comes and gates and doors just start opening. And, and then Peter finds himself outside the outer gate in the, in the middle of the street. He walked past all the guards and all the gates. And Peter said, what just happened? How, how did that happen? But I don't know anything that could be scarier than to pass away in the sleep and in hell realize that for the, all eternity I'm lost. I mentioned a tied message together. I don't know of any bill of goods that Satan has sold a younger generation with this proliferation and this acceleration of the suicide rate. And some are blaming the pandemic. And I think it's the hopelessness we've cultured in the last 40 years that we're just animals. And you could say, and the old boy breaks up with a girl, the girl breaks up with a boy. Well, I'll show him. I'll just kill myself. And you'll find yourself in eternity. You didn't show anybody. By the way, in six months, he'll be dating someone else. In three weeks, they'll be talking about you at the lunchroom and say, well, that's a shame. Oh, I'll just end it. And I'll just show everybody. No, you won't. You'll find yourself in heaven or hell. Am I preaching it right? And hell is the word which we get. In Greek, we get the word pit. We get the word abyss. There's a movie called The Abyss. People go down in the cave, way down in the cave, find all kinds of hideous creatures. It's scary. There's a one in the abyss about going down the bathscope and going way down, finding this. Well, it ought to be scary because it's the depths. It's the pits. The pit. It has the idea of being down. There's also a Greek retranslation of the word. It has uh, that it's used for grave because cause it's a hole and it's being put in the ground. The Bible uses the word as a place of torment. And he prepared for the angels and cast them down into hell. Put them in a pit. Put them down into the ground. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. But that's not the end. Jude says he's reserved in them into that day of everlasting judgment. They're in a holding place. And the best way I can put this way is hell is jail. And it's hell enough, but it's jail. But it is not the final resting place. Revelation 19. And once again, I'll share. I'm going to just touch on it, but leave it a little more in depth for Wednesday night. Blessed are those that have part in the first resurrection. John chapter, 15, John chapter 15 talks there's a resurrection unto life. There's a coming back to life that is unto life. That's a promise of greatness and goodness and, vi and uh, vivaciousness and so like that. Living, but there's also a resurrection unto death. Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. I'm just going to say it. Stay as far away from anything that has to do with, far away with anything that has to do with the, the, the system of Antichrist. Brother Rick, you're trying to scare young people. Man, don't let anybody mark, chip, or tattoo your body. There, parents. I've just said it. Why? Because someday there's going to be someone that says it's going to be easy to identify with buying and selling by being marked. I get as far away from it as possible. I, I'm just trying to help. I know I've had friends in the Navy and I've had friends in life and say, hey, say, hey, say. I, I, I just, I'm just an old-fashioned gospel preacher. But if the Antichrist system has something to do with deceiving people to buy and sell that way, stay as far away from it as you possibly can. 
Amen. Amen, Brother Rick. That's good preaching. Amen. <laughs> go go back like old Brother Joe. Brother Joe Boyd came here, and I think he was he was taken back because at that time we had a couple of stern folks that they weren't they weren't going to give a holy grunt if you poked them with a with a cattle prod you know like that brother joe he got to preach and he found out that some even frowned and made face at him so he'd just jump over and say hey man brother joe that's good preaching he'd say something else he'd jump over here and say hey brother, brother joe keep preaching uh, the whole message long he became his own his own uh cheering squad no i i, I understand I come to this and I realize because that beast and that false prophet who deceived them into buying and selling and taking the image of the beast. Watch what he says. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with, fire, with brimstone. He threw these two human beings into a lake of fire. The Antichrist is a man. The false prophet is a man. And he threw them alive. I don't know of a scarier store in my life. I said I don't think I'd been a good coal miner. Tight, closed in, dark spaces. Whoo. Those old days when they'd put them little kids down them coal mines and put them in a little two foot seam because it was too short for too and confined for men and put them back in there and, and put a rope around their ankles so they'd crawl back in there and then pull them kids back out. I have seen those pictures. I wouldn't have done well. And Korah in the Old Testament, when he led that rebellion, and they perished in the gainsaying, Korah hoped to gain a bigger position by standing against Moses. You take too much on you, Moses. Aren't we all holy? Aren't we all special? Uh, and uh, by the way, I want your position and Aaron's. I don't want to just carry the tabernacle around. I want to be the high priest that gets the flesh hook and gets the stake. That's what Korah was after. I want higher pay. I want better food. I want Moses, so you don't get to be the only leader. Uh, Moses said, uh, Lord, show them who's chosen for this leadership. If they just die a normal death, and there's, you know, then they, God, they won't know the difference. Um, but I tell you, when that ground began to tremble, and it opened up, and it swallowed down Korah and all his family alive, to me, that's a scary thought. And they went alive into the pit. Folks, we can't, we can't run from these things are God's word. And he knows how to deal with the rebels. And I can't help but think, if that foolish father Korah, who led his family to hell, can you? Follow me, kids! And uh, I guess the thought that comes to my mind, Revelation 20, verse 10, it's not only the, the Antichrist and the false prophet and those who took, followed the false prophet. I guess you'll see why important is Peter's study about the last days and the deceptions. It's serious business. Verse 10, 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's an eternal place prepared for the devil and his angels. It's an eternal place of torment forever. And someday the devil himself, a spiritual being, is cast in the same place where those human beings are. Oh, I'm going to go to hell and be with all my friends. You fool. We're going to party it up for all of eternity and live like we want. Are you nuts? One time a smart aleck fellow, a smart aleck fellow was, probably, was me. One time, one time someone pulled that on me on visitation. Hardy har har, I'm going down with all my friends and we're going to have a lot better time than you. Uh, you're going to heaven and play on harps. He pulled that. You're going to heaven and play on harps. Little does he know about the Bible. 
And you're going to just be floating around in clouds, clouds and we're going to be having a party in hell. And I said, well, just you and your friends go light your oven up, stick your hands in there, and tell me how much fun you have while you're burning. That was my smart aleck answer. But it was the truth. There's not much fellowship in a fire. There's not much fellowship in torment. How many of you ever... How many have ever been in a hospital in really serious shape? I, I very, I doubt of 20, I don't know how many years. I doubt I've ever told you folks how, you know, Lord's been good to me. But I went, Matt Trump, we, we both have share something in common. We've both gone through the windshield of a car. <laughs> and why we're still here today is God's grace. I laid on the ground and heard them tell. I laid there on the ground. I, I was unconscious, but I... Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. I heard them tell them, got three fatalities. And I looked, the guy beside me, the guy beside me said, I guess I'm one of them. That night, one of the fellows lost his leg. Was, I laid there in the emergency room and, and heard a fellow in this room screaming and heard it with the same car, car accident I was in. The fellow in this room screaming, screaming myself, you know, once in a while when I woke up. There's no fellowship in suffering or in torment, you know what? Not like that. Let's leave that off. Especially when your conscience is, I was the one that fell asleep. I was the one that caused them fellas. Well, one of them's leg amputated that night. And the Bible says, in their consciousness, their worm dieth not. And for all of eternity, they'll know why they're there and suffering, and maybe who they led there with them. I always leave that come there. Somewhere out there, Revelation 20, verse 14. Now let's, let's put, see if we can put this together. Revelation 20, verse 14. Uh, 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. All that to say this, hell's just the... Hell's just jail. Hell's where he has the angels and those who die without the Lord confined right now in a pit. And someday that grave and hell in a second resurrection are going to let them all come up and stand before the great white throne of God and God's going to judge them according to their works. We'll save that to Wednesday night, and here's God, what's God's going to say. And he's going to cast death and hell and that, from that resurrection into a lake of fire. And friends, somewhere out there is that lake. I read about stars. Aren't they pretty at night? They're pretty from a distance. Black drop sky. Stars like our sun's a star. Stars is a yellow sun. Is a yellow star. Our sun, only 27 million degrees at its core, about 11 million degrees on its surface. It's a bunch of, well, it's a bunch of gases. But more than that, it is one nuclear chain reaction explosion after another. White stars, red stars. Um, Blue stars, hotter than all of them. Gives you kind of an idea that a lightning bolt, one lightning bolt can generate like 50 million degrees. Can you believe that? Lava flows at a little, somewhere around 2,000 degrees. You know what comes up out of the center of the earth? Volcano, you know what that's you know what's flowing there? That's lava. Hell's hot. Lake of fire somewhere out there. 
as a star. Some gaseous lake. How, how, big is, how big is outer space? How big is the heavens? Trillions and trillions of light years. So they asked the question, somewhere space has got to end, right? So you go six trillion light years out there and you find a galaxy and then you go trillions of light years past that and you find another galaxy. So somewhere there's got to be this wall. Space got to end. No. What's on the other side of the wall? Somewhere out there is the Father's house. It's a fold for the sheep. Somewhere out there is a prepared place for the devil and his followers. And it's a place for the goats. It's the eternal lake of fire. So Brother Rick, what, what do you say it could be even good about that? Acts chapter 4. Verse 29, pray with us that we may speak the word of God with all boldness. Nobody likes a subject on hell or eternal lake of fire. I don't even like it. Sometimes it's just hard to grasp that, there, that there's such an eternal place. Pray for the Holy Spirit conviction. This man has deceased. For years when I first came, he sat right there between Miss Jean and Donald, right in that pew, right there. In the invitation time, almost every invitation, I said, do you know for sure you're saved? Would you raise your right hand or you raise your hand? God bless you. If, do, do you have doubts? Do you, do you know you're lost? Do you know you need to be saved? Would you want me to pray for you? I just almost did every invitation that way. He'd raise his hand. So I'd go to his house. I could take you to the house, but he'd let you know who it was. He kept coming to church, but he started to quit raising his hand. He said, no, I, I can't be saved. No, I won't be saved. No, I can't be saved. No, I won't be saved. Not now. Not now. Not now. Do you know you need to be saved? Yeah, I need to be saved. Then he quit raising his hand. Now, I kid you not, only the Lord, only the Lord knows this would happen. Tammy and I went somewhere. It was a ball tournament. We'd gone away, but the girls came back and were coming back late. We did not go on the ball tournament, but we said we would meet the folks that were going to drop off our kids, Christy at that time, at the Princeton Rec Center, and we'd pick up Christy in the Princeton Rec Center parking lot. They came back. It was going to be somewhere between around 1130. I got to the Princeton Rec Center about 1115, and just out of the spur of, of who knows why, I said, well, I'll just drive around and see what's behind the Princeton Rec Center. I drove around 1120 at night around Princeton Rec Center was that man in an affair with another woman. What do you do? See you in church. No, I just drove around and said, that's a shame. He quit coming, obviously. Where, where does it happen where someone, I need to be saved. I know I need to be saved. I'm not going to get saved. As far as I know, never did. As far as I know. What do you all think? So someone asked me before, on this side, what, what if God no longer speaks to my heart about eternal things, about needing the Lord? Here's my answer. Run as fast as you can to the altar of the church and beg God to speak to you again. Amen? Because God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you know someone that's lost and they seem as cold as an iceberg to the things of God, what should I do? Uh, well, pray for boldness that you may witness the things of God. Pray that you may have speech seasoned with salt, saying the right things that they need to hear. 
Uh, number three, pray that the Holy Spirit, which God says in the scripture say in John 15, is given to reprove of wickedness, or you should say of sin and judgment. Pray that God's Holy Spirit would again turn on the witness to their heart. Beg God to speak to them. Amen. And then number three, throw yourself by faith on, the, on God's grace. I'm convinced of this, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. There are times I make decisions in life where I could go either way. Ask Tammy if this isn't so. And maybe one or two of you know me knows this. Which way do you lean just a little bit more? If, if the decision is 51%, 49%, I go with the 51%. And I think sin is exceedingly wicked. And the, it, you got an idea of this. It was in my <laughs> this message, preaching in my dream. We have to comprehend the holy righteousness of God. That is hell. That is the lake of fire. That's what the lake of That's how righteous God is. But how loving is God? took his only son to die for our sins and simply offered us if we'd receive him by faith he'd forgive us all our sins and where sin abounded grace abounded more and I thank the Lord that if they're that close grace is still able to to save the vilest of sinners and change the worst of lives and give to us the Father's house. What a wonderful thought. Preach the gospel. That last utility bill of the church set me back. Our utilities bill went to $800 and $700, $800. I thought, okay, this one's going to be $900. And that last utility bill was $1,700. Yes, folks, we did our best. We, I called someone from the, I called someone personally from the power plant and said, who did I talk to? This, this can't be right. Yeah, we got our new blue meter. This, this thing's not right. Okay, we'll, we'll double check that. And then Amy's on all, you know, no, you got the 14% raise tacked on, and we, we've looked at your meters, and it, it's red electronic. Uh, oh, so I said, well, we, we've had that two, like two times in a row. And I said, man, what missionaries are we going to need to cut to make our bills? Can you believe that crossed my mind? We're about to drop three or four missionaries, pay our utility bill. Then it comes back to my mind. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. I don't, may not get many things right, but we've got one thing going that I know is right. As far as I know, supporting those orphanages, supporting those church planners, getting those letters where people are being saved in Taiwan, Philippine Islands, India, Gambia, West Africa, London, tuk tuk to yuck up there in North, uh, up there in the Arctic Circle, Alaska. I should keep going. Somewhere today, someone is going to be saved for the ministry of the church. Go you in all the world and preach the gospel long as possible that's what we got to do we've got to keep telling the lost you need to switch homes what get out of the prepared place for the devil and his angels into the prepared place for the saints of God in the father's house that's our business let's close with a word of prayer
Holy Father and Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts, we pray. Ask for your blessings on the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing a verse two invitation. I know there's things up here. If you'd like to have a word of prayer, if you've never, if you don't know for sure you're saved, see me today. Let's make sure we get that settled. And we're singing, Jesus is calling. That sounds like it. Verse 1. Jesus is tenderly calling, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today, Jesus. Jesus is calling, tenderly calling to <coughs> Verse 4. Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. They hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Rise and away. 